Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Punch Up Pod with Lila and Pat. Please forgive us for our uh, slightly delayed start. We were so on top of everything. We even talked for a couple hours last night. We had everything set out. And we should then, never have done that. We should right never have prepped. <laughs> we should just wing it like we always do, and we would have no problems. Total kiss of death was trying to prepare. No, I mean, we always prepare, but we were really like even more on top of it. And then Pat had a uh, computer computer issues right before we started. So um, we're, we're getting a little bit of a late start. And those of you who know my OCD, it's a... Uh, it's kicking in hard, but but, but right. I will prevail. Um, yeah, and it, the, the the problem is mine. My computer crashed, and uh, I can't get it back up. It's got some issues. So I'm normally, you know, not the tannest guy in the world, but I'm not quite as uh, <laughs> fish pink as I am right now. And I'm disappearing in the background because the green screen's not set right and We're all that good weird. stuff. But nobody really cares about that. So. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we will we'll plow through. I think we'll be okay. Um, so uh, how was your week? <laughs> Besides this, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm very happy. I, last week I announced that I'd got a new kitten and he kept me up uh, for three days straight. And then I had a birthday and uh, his That's birthday right. present to me, her, her, birthday. her birthday present to me was to uh, let me sleep at night. So she stopped screaming every night and I... Have been very happy with her since then, and life is good. That is lovely. Sleep deprivation is no joke, so I'm I'm glad that she uh, she's abiding by the house rules. Yeah, oh, thank you. How's your week? <laughs> um, you know, I we have a wonderful guest today, and I feel like let's let's dive in because we have so much to discuss with him. Um, we are so excited to bring on David Walsh, who is the arts editor for World Socialist website, which is one of my favorites. Uh, and we are we feel so fortunate to have you here. How are you, Mr. Walsh? Good. I'm very thrilled to be here. Even um, if it's three minutes late. Even I know, uh, but forgive me, really. I mean, uh, anybody who knew my my late father, whom I adored, but was always punctual, and if you were ever late, he would reprimand you and say, somewhere in the back of your head, you were saying, fuck Harry, he can wait. So please don't take this personally, anyone. It was a technical difficulty. It was not personal. Um, so we're so excited to have you because... Uh, we are in the midst of what is being termed the hot labor summer, and it's given so many of us a ton of hope to see outside activism and solidarity, because uh, one thing we discuss all the time is that nothing seems to happen good <laughs> with our Congress or elected officials. Um, and so there's this huge excitement as all of these different unions are converging in strikes during this summer. Um, so we just kind of wanted to bring you on and discuss what your feeling is about, you know, in particular SAG and WGA, but also how it feeds into the broader workers movement. Well, I mean, you know, I think it is extremely important and extremely uh, vol volatile situation. I mean, I think your strike the writers and the actors is just one one expression of the enormous anger that exists. I mean, what's that's what's really coming out is the accumulated anger over decades, not only over wages and conditions, but over everything. Come on, everything. The pandemic, the war, endless wars, yeah. the endless lying, the endless thieving. There is just an enormous popular sentiment, I think, that's pent up. And these strikes are just the beginning of it. I mean, I think you're going to look, this is you haven't seen anything yet. There is going to be social explosions in the United States and not only in the United States internationally, unlike anything we've seen, because you've had the corporations have their way. The rich have had their way for decades. They've stolen everything. They've monopolized everything. And now there is, and there is inevitably going to be an enormous popular reaction. What stands in the way is the union apparatus, because they're they're the gatekeepers for the employers at this point, and they're trying to they're trying to suffocate this movement, as in the case of the Teamsters in particular. But there's a very powerful movement developing, very powerful, and it, and, and I think the writers and actors have taken an enormously courageous stand. I mean, you're, you're dealing with some of the most powerful corporations in the world 
who are basically out, frankly, to destroy you. I mean, or to atomize you. you know? Yeah. And it's a it's a it's a it's a very big development. It's it's very courageous. Well, yes, and you know there. So I go on the strike uh, lines in the morning. It's really hot here, and you know actors can be a little delicate. So uh, it's usually like between nine and one or nine and two, so that we're not you know suffering heat stroke in addition to everything else. Um, you know, uh, this is a lesson in that never get to know your heroes. I we have been profiling Sean O'Brien so much over the past several months and the way he speaks and his, you know, uh, like ferocity when he talks to the, the CEOs. And then I met two of your colleagues on the first day I was on the strike line and they disabused me of that notion, uh, Mark Wells and, and Jacob Cross. And now we are seeing that, you know, right away, uh, corporate media jumped on this historic deal and how fantastic it is. And they are just going ahead with that headline. And in reality, when you start listening to rank and file, they are incredibly upset about being sold out. Yeah, I mean, he, I'm sorry, but he's a windbag. He's a windbag and a demagogue, and he exists in order in order to sort of fool people and to make them think there's some big change. You know, look, what did we say? That the, that the part-time words will make $23 at the end of this contract, which is really $18 in current dollars. In 1978, part-timers start, started out at $7.75, which is $36 today. So what you're, what you're talking about is almost a 50% cut, in fact, taking place over the last 50, 45 years. Historic. And that's, and, that's, and that's, you know, that's prevalent throughout. If you were actually to examine what actors and writers, it would be something like 20, 30% decline over the last several decades. This is a universal process. And yeah, O'Brien is, I'm sorry, I've, I've seen the O'Briens for decades and Lindsay Dougherty and all these people. I know. They're windbags. They're demagogues with their empty gestures of solidarity while they stab you in the back. You just, workers just have to see you through it. And they will. They will. Yeah, I'm curious to see how they vote. I guess they have between the today and I think they have two more weeks to vote. Well, there's obviously an enormous propaganda campaign, as you mentioned, you know, and I, I can't say. I mean, there's obviously a big opposition, but the problem is often, in, in, you know, or one of the problems is often workers say to themselves, well, with this kind of leadership, if we go on strike, are we going to get anything more anyway? Right. That's, in other words, even if people voted for it, were to vote for it, it wouldn't be a vote of confidence. It would be more or less the same, well, a certain amount of resignation that they're not going to get anything better. Because right. these are the people who are leading you. They're telling you it's historic. And then you're supposed to send them back to the bargaining table. Why are they going to come up with anything more? They've right. already given up. So it's a difficult situation. It's a difficult yeah. Situation. And so I am very worried about that happening. Not so much with the writers. I'm not, I don't know enough about their uh, union leaders. But with SAG, knowing that uh, Gavin Newsom is now inserting himself in some back deal discussions with his big donors who are, you know, the heads of studios. Um, and I don't think that Fran Drescher is necessarily up to the task of demanding what we all need. So do, do you have any insight into how the entertainment industry is progressing in this, this way? You know, I think, look, I was there in the 2007, 2008 strike. We wrote 40 articles at the time. I was there the evening of the the, the vote, the Reuters vote, and there were a lot of illusions. Well, there were a lot of illusions, and there also was people were worn down after 100 days, you know. Uh, and that's usually the strategy, is wear people down, and they'll, they'll, they'll put up with anything. They'll accept a deal. You know, and we were told then it was historic, and we wrote, and I can, I can quote you, but we yeah. said at the time, which is, no, it's a lie. In fact, writers' incomes are going to decline. They got nothing on streaming, or next to nothing. And that's absolutely been vindicated. And nobody else was saying it except the World Socialist website at the time. Yeah. And even I'm, and I, you know, and unfortunately, some of the writers themselves fooled themselves at the time. But the reality is, as the union now admits, they've lost almost everything through streaming. Yeah. So what's going to happen? Look, let's go through the process just for a second. Okay. They, the idea was the writer, of course, they, they more or less let the writers go out and they were hoping they were going to be totally isolated. They'd be out there for months and they'd smash them up. As the deadline article said, when they begin losing their houses and their apartments, then they'll come back, come crawling back to us. Now, the SAG after thing, see, I think threw them for a loop because the kind of semi-revolt that took place through that open letter 
Right. And you remember the moment when Frank Drescher and Crabtree Island have been making great progress. We're this close from a deal. Yeah. And people said, hey, wait a moment. You know, yeah. we're really suffering out here and you're going to come up with peanuts. So that put a monkey wrench in the process. And when the, the actors walked out, that, that, that did disrupt the plan. I mean, the directors, you know, it's a different group and it's a somewhat more conservative group historically. And even there, only 30% of the membership actually voted for the contract. You know? Right. Um, so I think their plan, their plan so far has been just to let you go out there and starve and hope that you come back, you know, accepting crumbs. And now they're starting, it's interesting, they're starting the negotiations that has obviously a certain significance. You know, right. because they, they didn't really want to do that, particularly with the writers. They wanted to be, them to be out for six months. Right. So I would be very careful. I'd be very, I think there are great dangers. I don't think, look, no, these people are not up to the task. They're absolutely, even, even if you were to take them as sincere human beings, whether, and I'll leave aside whether they are or not. Right. Utter, look, you're, you're dealing with utterly ruthless predatory interests. You have to yeah. understand. This is not. A, this is not a you know a wrestling match where you stand up afterwards and shake hands and it's good. These people want to destroy you. They want a handful of actors making a lot of money and everybody else to be a day laborer, a gig worker, yeah. who makes you know a hundred dollars a day, a couple, whatever the hell it is, and that's it. And then you're disposed. You're called in when needed and disposed of. Or right. they scan you and you don't even yeah. have to be called in. That's yeah. what they want. Now, the writer situation is a little bit more complicated, but essentially the same situation. And it's a process that's going on in every industry. Right. And that's what's happening to the UPS workers. They're part-time workers. Yeah. They're supposed to live on a few hours of work a day. Can't be done. So you have right. this relentless corporate assault. How do, you, how do you fight back against it? We're saying, no, we, don't, we have absolutely no confidence in the leadership of these unions. None. Zero. As far as we're concerned, there has to be a rank-and-file movement rank and file committees, take over the strike, demand, make real demands, 25% increases per wage increase, let the companies open the books so we can see what they're thieving, what they've actually been up to, and right. how they've been stealing from you for decades. Real serious demands. But that requires a different kind of leadership and a different kind of perspective. And that's what we're fighting for. Well, I agree with you. I was just thinking of the National Nurses United, which was under... Uh, Roseanne DeMauro was had some great leadership that really spoke up for the first time. And we saw we saw some leadership that the members agreed with for the most part, I think. And as soon as she left, uh, now we've got them voting to endorse Biden early on in the primaries. You know, so here's a guy who's going to veto Medicare for all. And, and the nurses are backing him. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's just a corporate shill. I mean, you know, you have the choice being a fascist fascist rant, ranter and raver in Trump, Trump and a corporate warmonger in Biden. It's not a choice. Both parties are parties of big business. The working class in this country needs to break from these parties once and for all. The, but the point is the union, it's not just a question of good or bad union leaders in our view. It's a question of their social perspective. Look, what's happened, there's been a transformation. in the. When I was a kid, I mean, you could say the unions were led in many cases by pretty questionable elements say the least, but unions were obliged to play a role of defending a certain share of the national income for workers, okay? They were defensive organizations, but they did put up a certain defense and workers were able to use them. That's not, that's out the window. The working class has lost its share of the national income and the unions have facilitated, look, I live in the Detroit area. Detroit is an utterly ravaged city, utterly ravaged. You fly in from the east and mostly you see green because there are no houses left. Okay. That's, that's the work of the United Auto Workers, one of the most reactionary organizations on the face of the earth that has accepted hundreds of thousands of job losses, ha cutting in half the wages for new hires, thanks to Mr. Obama. Absolute devastation of this area without lifting a finger for 40 years. And yet the union is richer than ever, has more assets than ever. There are more bureaucrats making $200,000 $200, a year than ever. So obviously the interests of the members, the workers, right. the interests of the leadership, they're not identical. They, they're right. opposed, you see. They are prospering 
while the workers are suffering. Yeah. That's why we say there has to be a revolt. There has to be an abolition of the bureaucracy. The working, the rank and file has to take control. Yeah. I mean, and opening books and going through the national process. Going through everything with a fine tooth comb, I think you're right, is such a great way to start. I can't imagine that will be happening, uh, at least not voluntarily. And I'm not totally sure how to put pressure on the union leaders. But in the articles that I've been reading on Sean O'Brien on your website, to see and the you know uh, all the union leaders the salary that they are raking in really does reveal exactly where their interests lie. Yeah, these people are in the top five percent. In some cases, the top one percent. I mean, you talk yeah. about the ninety-nine percent. The union officials are in that one percent. Many of them. You know. Yeah, and that's only their salaries. Okay, right, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. That's these are very corrupt people for the most part, and their their incomes are enormous. And yeah. they identify with this social system. They identify with management. That's who they hobnob with. Now, of course, right. like Mr. O'Brien, they go out on holidays or when the occasion requires and make demagogic speeches about how they're fighting the greedy, you know, the greedy capitalist enter. But it's a lot of nonsense. Right. You, know, you don't judge people by what they say about themselves, but what they do. And they're selling these workers out, confining them to poverty. That's the, that's the reality. Right. So but what you said, put, put no, see, we're not interested in putting pressure on them. We're interested in creating uh, committees, organs that will take power away from them. We're not we're not going to call right. on Mrs. Dre Ms. Drescher and Mr. Crabtree and beg for anything or, or even put pressure on them. No, we have to we have to create our own organizations. The working class in this country has to once again, like it did in the 1930s, act in its own interests. Not wait for the union leaderships, not just walk the picket lines, but take its own initiative. That's tough. That's yeah. going to be a process. And we understand that. We're also very right. patient about that. But right. that's what's going to happen. The workers are really going to have to take the initiative. And that hasn't happened in this country for a very long time. Yeah. And I mean, my, my concern is that because it does take a while to form these kinds of committees of rank and file, that we will suffer a horrendous deal that will be, you know, blasted out through all of corporate media about how it's historic. And, you know, thank goodness that, you know, Fran Drescher gave her speech on Versailles and look what she managed to accomplish just the way they're talking about Sean O'Brien. And then we're just stuck. And then anytime I say anything, I'm just like the salty complainer. And, you know, people are just so excited to get back to work because they are desperate. You know, as I've mentioned so many times, we lost our house after the first, after the writer's strike in 2007, it is scary. So I understand why people want to go back to work, but to not be able to reveal the truth of these agreements just kind of consigns us to, you know, another several decades of this. Well, and worse and worse. I mean, you know, this is a kind of existential moment. I'm not saying it's all over, but you know, it, it, things are going to get worse. I mean, because the corporate, it isn't just greed. The corporations, look, they lost a half a trillion dollars in market value last year, the entertainment comp companies, because of their streaming, not very successful streaming services. I mean, they're losing a lot of money. Now, I have no sympathy, but for them, that's the reality. I know they make their executives are making a lot of money, but as far as they're concerned, right. they're under siege. They have to right. take it out of your hides. They have to, I mean, for the writers to demand big increases, they're saying, well, are you crazy? We want you to make half of what you're making. You right. know, I mean, there is an actual capitalist crisis. Yeah. It takes peculiar forms in different industries, but they are pressed. But Wall Street is demanding share values must go up. You must cut costs. You must drive people out of the industry. I mean, artificial intelligence is in one way, obviously streaming, all the technologies, as far as they're concerned, are simply ways to lower costs. Right. But in regard to what struggle decides, you, you know, you can't, you, you never, in a certain sense, have the exact right moment to start, but, you, the, right. but the struggle has to begin, you know. Right. Uh, and whatever the immediate, you know, vicissitudes, I can't predict. You can't, you, you know, right. none of us know sitting in this meeting precisely what's going to happen. But I do know that if there isn't a struggle, it will be <laughs> it will be bad. Right. The only way that things will change is when the struggle begins. And when you tell people the truth, even if you're isolated and even if you're not 10,000 people to begin with, no significant movement, including, incidentally, 
the unions in this country began with masses. Okay, the Screenwriters Guild began with a handful of people, mostly left wing. They were blackballed and blacklisted and red baited for years. You know, but to their credit, they persisted. You know, you wouldn't have the auto workers except for the sit-in strikes in Flint. You wouldn't, you know, that's how it began with small numbers of people in some cases. But the, that would look. First of all, let me just tell you, the, the people are watching the writers and actors strike. We had a, I don't know whether you know, saw it on our website, but I was just fascinated. We were going around the country talking to auto workers, and it was an auto worker in Kentucky. I'm not sure if it was Louisville or where it was. An auto worker in Kentucky who was taking, talking about actors and writers and residuals. Okay, this is an <laughs> auto worker who now faces their, you know, his particular struggles, and he was very attentive to the fact what actors and writers were doing. People are watching, right. and it has already been inspiring in many ways, you know, but in terms of the fight, well, it's, you know, you, you begin the fight when you, where you are and where, you, you right. know, what you can do, you know, and we have to begin the fight. There's no other way, because the, the alternative is poverty. The alternative is insecurity. The alternative right. is not just losing your house, but losing everything. Right. And that's not possible. Um, Pat, did you have a question before? I did want to move on to the interim, the SAG interim agreements just to ask uh, David about his feeling about that. But did you have anything to ask? No, I mean, I just wanted to add uh, the, the moment is ripe. I mean, we see it across uh, all the industries. You know, like you said, there's there's uh, there's solidarity with auto workers, with the Actors Guild, which you would not think that's a natural uh, allyship. You know? <laughs> yeah. So. So there are, and people are seeing, you know, that they're they may not be huge success stories, but they see striking workers are winning something. And so that is contagious. That is something that that breeds more strikes. So there's optimism, room for optimism in, in it somewhat. So Sorry, just the other the other point of that, of course, is and as I'll make this very brief, is there's also the proletarianization of actors and writers themselves. Right. I mean, even in 2007, 2008, I mean, because it isn't just the auto worker talking about the actors. We talked about the actors and they talked to us about UPS. Well, that wouldn't have happened even 15 years ago, you see, yeah. because the actors and the writers now identify themselves with the rest of the working class in a very different way. And that's also significant. Sorry. It is. We actually we have a video that was sort of uh, inspiring and fun. Um, if you don't mind, I'd just love to show it. Uh... This, here we go, let's This see. is a hot labor summer. As you guys are getting ready for what could come next, we've got workers on strike here in Chicago, all over the country, SAG-AFTRA went on strike. And don't you think that all these fights aren't the same? People who are actors and performers in Hollywood, more often than not, are part-time workers that aren't making the big salaries that the big stars are making. In fact, a lot of them are waiting tables or working on the docks as part-timers for companies like UPS, whether it be in California, New York, or right here in Chicago. That makes me feel like people are understanding that we're all one people, you know what I mean? I'm totally down with the team students. You know about the other uh, artistic unions, and it's good to know these guys are with us. So whether it's an actor's union, writer's union, director's guild, uh, the Teamsters, whatever, I think we're just asking but what's fair. And if one person is disadvantaged, then all of us are disadvantaged. That's how you shut a city down. When the Teamsters, the steel workers, the electricians, when everybody is is, is together saying, what do you need? How can we help? It, it doesn't make our voice just a punch. It makes it a sledgehammer. Hello again. Lila. Calling Lila. There we go. We can push. We, I know we push buttons uh, at the same time, and you know we need we need to unionize our jobs here. Um, so you know that kind of solidarity. I agree with you. We didn't. People didn't even say the word that I, I didn't hear people talk about solidarity in 2007, or it was a very small subgroup. You know now there's like a language of militancy amongst the unions, and that's I think incredibly exciting. The only thing I would say is you still got to sort out. It's not solidarity with union leaders because their solidarity is, I won't say the word, is a lie. Okay. Yeah. Solidarity with the rank and file, yes. Yes. But, but demagogues at the top, no. But anyway, that's the thing that workers I, have to figure out. 
I agree. And so this brings me to the next part I wanted to ask you about. There's a lot of talk about this interim agreement that SAG has allowed independent movie companies who have said they will honor or are honoring all of the demands. I mean, again, this is, was all done without rank and files knowledge, but right. set in place that uh, any independent studio not working with the AMTPT could honor all of SAG's demands that we have right now and continue to shoot movies. So the the biggest notable company is A24. They, they I mean, they produce a ton of fantastic, not even that small, but, you know, features. They're kind of like the Miramax of the 2020s. Um, and, you know, some people argue uh, or defend it by saying, well, if this small company is willing to do it, this should prove to the big companies that it's possible. Um, but there has been quite a bit of reaction from some people, and I think it summed up pretty well, if you forgive me for showing another video, but it's Sarah Silverman talking about it, because I'd really love to hear where you come down on all of it. So I, I don't know if this will remove us or not. I'm going to try. But I'm not understanding. Oh, God, stuff he knows all of a sudden. Because I feel fucking pissed off. And I know I just must not be understanding something. There are like 40 movies being made right now. Movie stars are, are making movies because they're independent movies. And SAG is allowing it because if they do sell it to streaming, it has to be because streaming is abiding by all the things we're asking for. That's just... That's just working. That's, I mean, the strike ends when they come to the table and we make a deal and agreement. So that is going to be what happens. So you're just letting people make movies and movie stars are making movies that you know the goal is to sell them to streaming. And they're just, they'll, they, it, the, but the streaming service has to agree. Yeah, that's called the end of the strike, which is now going to be probably exponentially prolonged because they have movie stars making movies. Like the strike is supposed to be, especially when SAG joined the strike, it's, it's movie stars aren't making movies for you anymore. Now what are you going to do? Well, they're making movies. What the fuck? I got offered an indie movie. I fucking said no. And so did a bunch of my friends. And now some of my friends are saying yes. And I, I'm, I'm really pissed. Please explain to me why I shouldn't be angry because people are making real deal sacrifices. People, writers, actors, crew people, all these people are making fucking, they're sacrificing their livelihood for this cause. It's called Union Strong, where we are all together. And when SAG joined the strike, we should see every movie star out there striking along because you have insurance because of your union and you get residuals because of your union. And all these things that you get because of your union and you can't stand with your union. So I don't need, know if I'm mad at these movie stars that are making these indie movies that are obviously going to go to streaming. Or am I mad at SAG for making this interim deal for these indie movies? Like, what the fuck? It's scabbing. You've made that so clear that it's scabbing. Now, all of a sudden, movie stars can make movies if they're indie movies that where they promise they'll only sell it if X, Y, and Z. That's called the end of the strike, motherfucker. Can somebody... I think she made her point. Yeah. No, so what's your feeling? Of course she's right. As I think we could go further, but of course she's right. It's, it's, but, it's, but it's just indicative, you see, because you can't, you can't fight a sort of a three-quarter strike or a half a strike. I mean, that's, that exemplifies the attitude of, this, of the union bureaucracy. They're already trying to make deals. They're already trying to be polite and make deals and make right. arrangements and make right. behind, behind doors. Look, you and I know that in this industry particularly, the way it works. Look, there are people meeting in cocktail lounges or bars or hotels that are talking about this stuff and how to make a deal 
and how to sell this and how to push this, put this over long before there are official negotiations. Right. You have union leaders who, who, who hobnob in the same circle, particularly in this industry, in the same circle as management. No, she's completely right. It is scabbing and it's shameful and it shouldn't take place. You can have a strike, then you shut out, you shut down the entire industry. Shut it down entirely tomorrow, tonight. Right. Right. And if you're, if you're either in a serious fight or you're not in a serious fight. And the problem is these people are not in a serious fight. So like she says, the people are suffering. The actors and writers are serious, but the union leaders, no, they're not serious. They want a deal. They want the phone call that will free them from this horrible situation they're in. The last thing they wanted to do was to lead a strike. Right. You know, they, they got forced into it. They have these 97, 98% strike votes. What are, you know, and the and the and management gives you nothing. Well, then they didn't have much of a choice, you know. Right. As I said, although it took something of a semi-revolt in the case of Sag But yeah. they're waiting for the magical phone call that will release them. And this is just part of that. It's part of right. that process. Part of the process also of soft, softening up the membership too. So she's right. See? As far as she goes. Is that what you would say in response to some actors and people? I mean, I'm seeing in the chat and I, I'm not sure exactly how to combat it is that people say, well, look, if a small independent company can acquiesce to all of our demands, doesn't that show prove that the studios are just being, you know, I mean, who cares? They don't care that they're, that they're monsters, but doesn't that prove that it would be possible for big studios to do? No doesn't prove that. I think, look, I, the point is they're, 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 these are companies with, with obviously deep pockets and a lot of money, but they're involved, as I say, in a cutthroat competition. Netflix is not the only streaming service. There are in the world scale hundreds now, and they're in a life and death battle against one another. And, and, and the only way they can compete is by introducing the new technologies, and the only way they can do that is then by lowering costs and driving workers out of the industry. So you, as I say, you're either going to have an all-out strike or you're not going to have an all-out strike. Right. No, no, shut them all down. Yeah. Make sure everybody understands the seriousness of the situation. Meet and have mass meetings and discuss it. You know, that, that doesn't happen. The union, look, we're opposed to this whole behind the closed doors business anyway. Right. It's right. absolute nonsense. Nothing good comes out of that. Right. Why should it be behind closed doors? Yeah, absolutely no reason. The workers, that's part of the, the whole issue with rank and file committees. We're saying that open everything, including the books of these companies. Right. Let, let's everyone know what's actually going on. You know, build a rank and file committee that will negotiate in public, that will make its demands and say, no, we're standing on this and we're not going to back and work until we get this. Right. Otherwise, it's not a serious struggle. Otherwise, you're already giving them. You know, you're already adapting to their demands and you're you're halfway to losing at that point. <laughs> right. So all Yeah, and I think it's just picking winners for these few independent groups that are gonna have actors it also. And like how did that deal come to pass between whoever made the decision to allow that within SAG? I mean, I know it's you guys part, are going to all vote on it. but It's part of their accommodations. It's part of their right. attempt to be polite and reasonable and respectable. And you don't win struggles by being polite and reasonable and respectable. Yeah. Never, the, the American working class or the working class in no country has ever won anything that way. Yeah. <laughs> so when it came to the yeah. auto industry, they had to go into the factories and seize them. They sat in and they stole the property. They sat there. They faced off the National Guard. That's why you had the auto workers union to begin with. You know, right. The coal miners fought and were hung and were shot and were killed and <laughs> died by the hundreds yeah. to fight to build a union. The, work, the working class has never won anything by being respectable. Nothing. <laughs> You're simply asking to get kicked in the teeth. A so <laughs> yeah, and that is, that's a mythology that persists now where they talk about, you know, it's all the tone policing and can't we just get along and, you know, the cement workers who on strike left the, uh, the, the truck going and the Supreme Court came down on the side of the company saying that they were what they did was illegal because they harmed property. It's amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, you have this move now to basically illegalize strikes by saying, well, they cause economic damage. Well, that's what a strike is supposed <laughs> to be. You know, sorry, yeah. pardon me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, 
Union Joe is the, the only one who's broken these strikes. Uh, it, it's really embarrassing if you're a Democrat to be selling him. He's he's selling himself as the union, you know. Well, when buddy. he says pro labor, he means pro union bureaucracy. See? Yeah, right. That's the point. And don't. And my answer to you is, well, don't be a Democrat because it's an utterly rotten, filthy party, party of big business that's leading the world to the edge of nuclear war at the moment. Incidentally, yes. <laughs> while we speak. Yeah. And uh, both parties are parties of big business and the working class in this country has to break absolutely once and for all and can't really get anywhere until it breaks from both of these parties. Absolutely. The worst are proud Democrats. Like I, I understand <laughs> embarrassed, like I'm pathetically apologizing and, you know, it's shameful that I'm well, a Democrat, a but but it's a choice I make. And I don't agree with that position either. But at least I understand that. But the proud Democrats are the ones that really don't know what the fuck's going on. Well, I mean, look, there's a difference between Democratic voters and the Democratic Party machinery. I mean, people, you know, people right. vote for the Democratic because they still have this vestigial, you know, memory or illusion about Roosevelt, Kennedy and Johnson when the Democratic Party hasn't actually introduced any social reform in this country since the early 1960s. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, and, and and millions and millions of people don't don't change their sort of political perspective like you change a shirt. It takes it's a it's a complicated process. And they really have to be convinced. I think, I think masses of, I mean, every poll would indicate that there's mass disgust with both parties and people don't know where to turn. You know, right. I mean, Trump's vote wasn't a vote of 60 million fascists. It was a, po a vote on a large part of the enormous disappointment and disillusionment of Obama. Yeah. You know, he was supposed to be the candidate of change. And many, millions of workers, black and white, voted for Obama because they said to themselves, well, look, he's black. He's got to understand our suffering. He's one of us. And he was a stinking politician of the rich, just like the others. Oh, well, he let Citigroup pick his whole cabinet, which should have given it all away. He, he gave the, the he, you know, he continued the bailout of Wall Street. He cut the auto workers wages in half. I mean, he was just another corporate shill. And so then people say, well, well, Trump's a demagogue, but he's he's promising to fight the establishment. He's saying this and that. Well, let's give him a shot. It's not because they're all fascists. I right. mean, there are fascists in this country. Sure, sure. But there are a very small number. There's just a lot of very confused people at this point. A great yeah. many people are at sea politically. Yeah, it's frustrating. And unfortunately, uh, we can't solve it all in, in one half hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's amazing to have you on and speak so eloquently about the struggle because uh, well, we are great, all feeling it, it to our core. A great pleasure. And I'm, you know, and I appreciate the fact that you're a striker that I'm speaking to. I mean, it, it means something to us too. Well, thank but you. Read the world, follow the World Socialist website because we really have the only coverage of these struggles. You absolutely do. I was just going to say before, before excusing you, where can people find you? WorldSocialistWebsite.org. WSWS.org. Uh, I read it daily. Okay. I think most most of our uh, viewers do also, and I think you even have a couple of, of people who are participating, who are writers on your site. So uh, it's, it's exciting to have you here. We thank you so much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, honored. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye bye. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye.